in this year that has been marked by so much pain and turmoil with the global pandemics of COVID, violence rooted in hatred and discrimination, economic systems where the rich get richer as the poor get left even further behind. It can be easy to be discouraged, disheartened, and weary. However, as people of faith, we are encouraged to be persistent in our work, to glorify our creator God, and to serve all of his creations, to bring about healing, restoration, and wholeness. In my nearly 50 years of life, I have learned that I can face anything better in community and kahuto. God created us for community, both with him and with each other. One of the silver linings of the current health pandemic is that we have the technology available to gather across space and time as we come together today to learn, listen deeply, and to grow in fellowship with one another. We have people joining us from all time zones and across all continents. We thank you for being with us this morning. It is my hope that our time together in this economic platform that we will understand that we are beloved of God and that we can be shelter and support to one another as we embark on a common journey of faith and work for a transformed and more just world. Please join me in a brief word of prayer. Expansive and creating God, thank you for gathering each of us together in this time and space. We ask that you open our hearts and minds to truly hear your voice this day. We pray for those who will be speaking, that you might guide their words. Above all, we thank you for your tremendous love for this world, expressed by the sacrifice of your son Jesus on the cross, who died that we might have life. Thank you for giving us companions in each other and in the gift of your Holy Spirit to encourage us in our often difficult work for the transformation and reconciliation. Amen. I would now like to turn over the microphone to my colleague and friend, Dr. Nina Balmaceda, who is the Associate Director of the CFR. She will introduce our first speaker. Buenos dias, good morning, everybody. We are delighted. And so grateful to God for each one of you who are joining us um, in this Institute for Reconciliation, COVID style online. There are many challenges, but we also have things to be grateful for and to celebrate together. And first of all, celebrate that we can be together to learn from one another and to learn from our wonderful speakers. Before I introduce today's first speaker, uh, let me just take a moment to tell you, just in case you may not be too familiar with our center. Our Center for Reconciliation is a unit of Duke Divinity School here at the University of Duke. Uh, We are located in North Carolina in the United States. And our purpose is to contribute to your theological formation. Um, especially to help faith-based communities and leaders in the journey towards reconciliation. We seek to encourage sisters and brothers who are already serving in the fields of transformation, peacemaking, peacebuilding, justice, and reconciliation, as well as groups and individuals who are interested in starting to cultivate this ministry in their own lives and communities. We learn with and from partners around the whole world. We are so grateful for our regional partners in the Americas, Asia, and Africa, as well as our friends around the world who are also following Christ's path of transformation and reconciliation. Our center and our regional partners cultivate a single theological vision that becomes contextualized where it is applied. That vision is called the Word Made Flesh methodology. As you can probably recognize, this expression, the Word Made Flesh, comes from John 1.14. The Word 
was made flesh and dwelt among us. The word, who is God, is at the core of our vision and our work. The word became flesh. The word became one of us. God walked in our shoes, in a violent land, in a land where oppression and injustice reigned. And he walked to show us how to live, how to do justice, how to love mercy, how to walk humbly. Jesus of Nazareth walked among us and he is with us, with us today through his spirit. This methodology we may call, may, we may describe it is as a contextual methodology. Becoming flesh means becoming part of a culture, of a history, becoming a people of reconciliation. The word, God himself, through us, acting through us, becomes part of a community. Therefore, the place from which we are doing theology and living out our theology matters greatly. Life and theology go hand in hand. Where we place ourselves and who we identify with inform how we discern what the Lord is asking of us. It is a methodology to inspire us to live out the gospel in every dimension of our life. Because in Jesus Christ, transformation and reconciliation are possible. And it is so important. Can you hear me? I'm sorry, I think I lost for a second my internet connection. My apologies, it's a sign of the times. Let me go to this. It, as I was saying, it is very important that we are rooted in a community, in a place and in contact with what's going on in our context. And we do live in a world that needs transformation and reconciliation desperately. These photos that I hope you can see uh, through my screen um, are just news from the last days. The convulsion in Colombia because of uh, the policies that go against the interest of the poorest people, the terrible violence in the Holy Land, the exploitation of workers, even in times of COVID, the abuse by people in the armed forces, uh, in the police against minorities. And the list will go on and on. It is important that we know where we are situated. And the Word Made Flesh methodology recognizes reconciliation as a pilgrimage, a pilgrimage where the church needs the academia and that academia needs the people working on the ground and in the church. And that those who are on the ground also need those who are working in academia. Together, we support one another because reconciliation in the way we understand it is a pilgrimage that we can only do together. It is not an individual pilgrimage, it's an invitation to become part of the new we. This collective pilgrimage has several stops or stations. Each station has a key question that we must consider with great attention. So in this 2021 Institute for Reconciliation, today, Wednesday, we'll be stopping to consider a very important question. Where are we going? This question will be addressed in today's plenary. Once we have considered this first question, tomorrow we will be considering what is happening? Where are we and how did we get here? With this question, we acknowledge that God has planted us in a particular place and in a particular community. And from that place, we observe and we pay attention to the painful realities of our world. And in response, God offers us the gift of lament. During our last day, this Friday, we will consider the question, where do we see signs of hope and liberation? 
how does liberation look like? Now, also for this Summer Institute, we offer you uh, addition, an additional gift to join us in three round tables. Tonight, Valerie will be guiding us in a round table featuring the directors of three of the houses of study here at Duke Divinity School, the Asian House of Studies, the Office of Black Church Studies, and the Hispanic House of Studies. The question they will be considering is how we together can move to be a center for reconciliation as a whole school. Tomorrow evening, we will be featuring our regional partners, the representatives from the Great Lakes Initiative for Reconciliation in Africa, from the Near East, the Northeast Asia Reconciliation Initiative in Asia, and the Americas Initiative for Transformation and Reconciliation will be joining us to, sh to share with us the progress, the challenges, and the dreams that their reconciliation initiatives have. And finally, on Friday in the morning, we will be uh, having an interdisciplinary global panel with theologians, philosophers, people working in the field of peace building. And we will consider very seriously the encyclical letter, Flatelli Tutti, of Pope Francis on fraternity and social friendship. I hope all of you can join us. So now it is my pleasure to introduce our director, Dr. Edgardo Colón Emeric, who will guide us in considering the first question of our world word made flesh methodology. Dr. Edgardo Colón Emeric is the Irene and William McCutcheon Associate Professor of Reconciliation and Theology. He is also the Associate Dean for Academic Formation here at the Duke Divinity School and Director of the Center for Reconciliation and Senior Strategies for the Hispanic House of Studies. Being, beginning on July 1st, Dr. Colón Emeric will serve as Dean of Duke Divinity School. His work explores the intersection of Methodist and Catholic theologies and Wesleyan and Latin American experiences. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Edgardo Colón Emeric. Grace and peace, sean con ustedes desde nuestro Padre y el Señor Jesucristo. Grace and peace be with you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a great honor and privilege for me to be here with you this morning uh, or afternoon or evening, depending where you are, and to speak with you about this question, uh, where are we going? It's a question uh, that may not seem like the first question to ask in the conversation about reconciliation, we want to begin with what's going on now, what's happening. And yet the Christian uh, uh, tradition brings some wisdom to saying we need to begin actually with the question of where are we going? What is the destination that God has prepared uh, for God's people and indeed for the world? Uh, as in a journey, the first thing in a journey when you, uh, if you're using a a GPS is to enter the destination. Where are you going? Likewise, in this journey, that is our first move to say, where are we? who asked this question? Where are we going? And to embrace the gift, the gift of the new creation. I'm going to be sharing with you some slides as we uh, as we reflect on this gift that we that God offers for us to consider today. So let me offer to share this, and now let me also see. Uh, see, this is trying to move this around. Okay, so let me challenge here let me stop sharing for a second and move it and move my screen around some some here okay let me try again now there we go and so where are we going the new creation our destination and i want to review with you 
uh, and to speak with you this morning uh, or the, our time is first of all about Christ as the beginning end and center of the way then to look at some pieces of this portrait uh, of Christ ultimately and biblical images on the of the end of our journey of reconciliation then to consider briefly a pilgrim of this journey and the theological vision of Oscar Romero before turning to uh, an, some some reflections summing up our journey uh, a guide for the disoriented and the way to the new, for the new to the new creation and i begin with as i said with christ christ uh, scripture tells us is the alpha and the omega the first and the last the beginning and the end and he is also the way and so christ is both at the beginning of our journey he's the the center line along the road and our destination. The, there's an image uh, in Colossians chapter one uh, that I find to be very helpful uh, in, 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 in orienting my thoughts around reconciliation and new creation. It says in Colossians 1, 15, he, Christ, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for in him all things, in heaven and on earth, were created things visible and invisible whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers all things were created by him and for him and without him uh, nothing that was and, and uh, sorry, sorry he is he himself is before all things and in him all things hold together he is the head of the body the church he is the beginning the firstborn from the dead so that he might come to have first place in everything for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, things in heaven or on earth, by making peace through the blood of his cross. And so I mentioned uh, uh, this passage as an orienting passage for us uh, by grounding our journey of reconciliation in Christ, in Christ in whom all things hold together, Christ who reconciles all things, a vision of reconciliation that is not only about the reconciliation of, of God and humanity, but the reconciliation of all creation, because all creation is created by God, and God cares for all creation, all creatures. And I and for me, the image of the mosaic, that like this image that you have before you of a mosaic of Christ, is emblematic of how I understand uh, Christ as being at the center of creation and of the vision of reconciliation, that it's all the creatures in creation uh, were made as pieces of this mosaic, and a mosaic that has become unglued because of sin, and so the pieces are all jumbled, and yet and it is Christ's work to bring all these pieces together and to and to uh, reconstitute the image in which create in which creation was made, which is the image of Christ, and so. As we now, as I now turn to biblical passages, uh, other biblical passages, I call, I refer to these passages as pieces of a portrait. That all these passages are offering us uh, pieces uh, or views of the portrait of what the new creation that ultimately looks like Christ looks like when we are still in on the way. And I begin with the transfiguration. Uh, is a story that is often uh, skipped over uh, by people when they're reading the Gospels as a strange incident on the way uh, of, G of Jesus to, Jer uh, to Jerusalem to be crucified. And, but it suggests to us that transformation is at the heart of the vision of, trans of the new creation. We see this very clearly in places like uh, Romans 12, verse 2, where we hear that we are not to be conformed to this world, but to be transformed or actually transfigured by the renewing of our minds so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. God is in the business of transfiguring creation, of transforming things, transforming them because they have become, uh, they have gone out of form. They have become malformed and need to be now reformed and conformed to the purpose for which God created them. Second Corinthians chapter three, verse 18 says, all of us with unveiled faces, seeing the glory of the Lord as though reflected in a mirror are being transformed 
or transfigured into the same image from one degree of glory to another, for this comes from the Lord, the Spirit. Here we see how it is that the, this vision of the transfiguration as a piece of the portrait of the new creation involves a process. It's not doesn't happen all at once. We are being transfigured into the image of Christ from one degree of glory to another. And we are being transfigured into this image of Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so we cannot speak of, of a new creation and of reconciliation without speaking about the work of the Holy Spirit. And we cannot speak about these things without acknowledging the limitations of our vision that we see and know only in part. We see this, for example, in 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we will be, what we do know is this. When he is revealed, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. That is to say that the transformation of the trans our transfiguration into the new creation is something that is not only unfinished, there is an element of mystery here. We only have, as I said, glimpses of the end because we do not yet see Christ in his fullness. We only see pieces of a mosaic. Let's look at another biblical uh, 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 piece of this, of this portrait and the sense of uh, new creation as uh, celestial harmony. After this, says the... John of Patmos in the book of Revelation, I looked and there was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the lamb, robed in white with palm branches in their hands. They cried out in a loud voice saying, salvation belongs to our God who is seated on the throne and to the lamb. God is creating a cosmic symphony where there are diverse parts in this symphony. Each creature has their own voice to contribute to the symphony. Angels, human beings, dogs and cats and trees and fish, they all have their voices and contribute their voices to the symphony under the direction of the Holy Spirit and, the tri and, and with, the, with Christ himself being the first violinist, the, the, uh, being, having a privileged role in the symphony and bringing us together. But the celestial harmony that is the new creation, which can be heard already in today's world, occurs in the midst of the cacophony and against the cacophony of diabolical powers. Revelation 13 verse five, seven says that the beast was given a mouth uttering haughty and blasphemous words, and it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. It opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven. And also it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. It was given authority over every tribe and people and language and nation. Notice that that refrain that we encountered in Revelation 7 about the diversity of of creation being united in, in a chorus of praise to the triune God can also be subverted by evil forces to worship the beast who is opening his mouth not in praise but in blasphemy. Uh, and, and, this, and this passage then of, in Revelation 13 is something we need to keep in mind when we consider passages like Romans 13, where we hear that every person should be subject to the governing authorities for there's no authority except from God, and those authorities that, have, that exist have been instituted by God. This is true. However, it is also true that these authorities instituted by God have been subverted by diabolical forces to become blasphemous. And when that happens, we need to be watchful and we need to name them and rebuke them in the name of Jesus. Uh, you see here this image in the screen of the statue of an angel. It's, an, it's a statue that I, it's an image I took a picture when I visited the Capitol building in Havana, Cuba. And there's a courtyard in the building. And in the center of this courtyard, this statue that you see before you. And it's not an image simply of an angel. It's an image of Lucifer, the fallen angel. Now, 
why in the world would someone put an image of the devil, a statue yeah. of the devil in the center yeah. of a capital building of a seat of government? I do not know. And yet it is representative of a tragic reality that the evil powers of this world are also have there's there are also enthroned in our seats of power. And when that happens, we need to be alert. And as I said, to rebuke. Another image, a piece of this portrait of the new creation is that of the peaceable kingdom. Some uh, image that so beautifully described in a number of passages in, in the, by the prophet Isaiah. Uh, and I'll read just sim simply a couple of excerpts in this passage, which you probably know very well. A shoot shall come from the stump of Jesse and the branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. His delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide by what his ears, ears hear, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor. And then skipping to verse 7, the cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie together, and the lion shall eat straw like an ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put its hand on the adder's den. They will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Just to note here, uh, this Im image, very famous image of a peaceable kingdom, uh, that at the same time that we see the, the harmony of the creatures and, and, of pe and animals and of peoples, diverse peoples, uh, it also covers up some sad realities and tragic realities because the picture that is depicted here, depicted here of the European colonists with the native peoples of this land is largely very fictive. It omits uh, the conquest and the violation of peoples in these lands to present a peaceable kingdom where there was in fact a kingdom, but no peace or not the peace of the kingdom of God that is, from, that is foreseen by Isaiah. And so I present this for us also as a warning again, that even as we have these images in the prophets of the end of the new creation as a peaceable kingdom, we need to distinguish that peace, that shalom from its counterfeits or, and copies in today's world. Another image we encounter in, in scripture is the new creation as a new Eden. Uh, where the angel and the angel shows John of Patmos the river of water of life, brightest crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the river of the street of the city. On either side is the river is the tree of the tree of life with its twelve kinds of fruit, producing its fruit each month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. And if the leaves of the tree are for the healing of, of the nations, or in the Greek for the therapy of the ethnics, it, it, that is the, the reason for it. it suggests to us that there are in fact, there are in fact wounds among the nations, wounds in our ethnicities, in our, among our peoples. Some of these wounds are, are deep within us. Some of, our, some of them are very obviously marked on our bodies or even across our landscapes. You see the image on the bottom left of your screen. It's a picture of the border wall between uh, uh, in Nogales and in Nogales, the frontier part with Arizona. And it, the caption reads on the wall, fronteras cicatrices en la tierra, borders, scars on the earth. The way in which we are divided, in which the world, ha world has been divided, has scarred, has created wounds. And yet there is this promise here of a tree of life and a promise of healing. In the words of a hymn by Justo Gonzalez, in, uh, in all four areas of faraway corners, sin is building embittering barriers, but our faith has no fear of such borders. We know justice and peace will prevail. To all four of us faraway corners, we're a people who point to tomorrow when the world living sovereign and peaceful is united in bonds of God's love. Another image for us uh, of the new creation is that new creation inaugurates a new way of life. Second Corinthians five, from now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view. Even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know him no longer that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, 
God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting the trespasses against them, and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ. And as ambassadors for Christ, we have a new way of living, something that you see in the epistle of Matthias to Diognetus, who describing the way of Christians, he says, they dwell in their own countries, but as simply as sojourners, as citizens, they share in all things with others and yet endure all things as if foreigners. Every foreign land is to them as their native country and every land of their birth as a land of strangers because we are ambassadors and where we are united, we are, we are presenting and uh, extending the reign of God, establishing an outpost of the kingdom, an embassy, an embassy that says here in this embassy, we are actually in kingdom territory, wherever it may find itself. So a new way of life and a joyful people. So an image again from Isaiah, uh, where we hear that God is about to create new heavens, new earth, the former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. Uh, and, and, uh, I won't read the whole passage again, but it says that God will rejoice in Jerusalem and delight in his people because no more shall the sound of weeping be heard in God's city or mountain or the cry of distress. And here are images for you of a church uh, upper, on your upper left in the community in Peru called Cerro de Pasco. A very, uh, it's a mining community at around 15,000 feet of elevation. And this church where I worshiped, it's located next to this tremendous hole, a, a, a gaping wound on the earth, exploitation from mining, and yet they claim to be a joyful people. Not a joyful people because they're hiding to, from the realities around them, but a joyful people because they believe that God is doing a new thing and that God that signs of new creation can be manifest in the midst of the old creation. Or in the words of his song from the Great Lakes Institute for Reconciliation, we, God's people, sing your praises as together we are sent to reveal the new creation in the shadows of lament. Give us courage for the journey. Shepherd Jesus be our guide. Help us lead with hope and passion till all things are reconciled. We sing of the new creation in the shadows of lament. We praise the risen Lord who still carries the wounds of, of crucifixion. And so as these pieces of the portrait of the new creation, I want to now compliment them by considering a pilgrim of this way uh, and the theological vision of Oscar Romero. Oscar Romero, Archbishop of El Salvador uh, from 1977 to 1980 when he was martyred while preaching uh, at the altar in a small chapel uh, where he, uh, next to his house. And he, R Romero uh, in his, uh, in a writing called The Political Dimension of Faith from the Perspective of the Poor, suggests a new way of reading the Bible. He says, these texts of scripture are not voices from the distant path, past. They are not only texts that we read reverently in the liturgy, they are ordinary experiences, realities whose cruelty and intensity we experience daily. We experience them when the mothers of and wives of captured and superior people come to us, when disfigured corpses appear in secret cemeteries, when those who struggle for justice and peace are murdered. And this new way of reading scripture prophetically leads to a new way of hoping, a new way of hoping because the church preaches the new heavens and the new earth, says Romero. And when the church preaches this, the church knows that no sociopolitical configuration can take the place of the fullness, the final fullness that God grants. She has also learned that transcendent hope must be sustained with signs of historical hope. Even if these signs are seemingly as simple as they shall build houses and inhabit them, they shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. And this new way of hoping leads to a new way of valuing life. Uh, Romero concludes that treat that uh, letter on the political dimension of the faith from the perspective of the poor by saying ancient Christians used to say, Gloria Dei viven somo, the glory of God is a living human being. We can make this more concrete by saying, Gloria Dei viven pauper, the glory of God is a living poor person. From the perspective of the transcendence of the gospel, I believe we can determine what the life of the poor truly is. And I also believe that by putting ourselves alongside the poor and trying to bring life to them, we shall come to know the eternal truth of the gospel. And what is this eternal truth? That Christ, 
who was rich became poor, and we encounter him among the poor. As we, as we read in the vision, in the words of uh, Jesus, uh, in the, in the, on the, about the final judgment in Matthew 25. As we've done it unto the least of these, we've done it unto him. And so I want to conclude by just offering a few guidelines for this way to the new creation and, uh, and a guide for the disoriented. We are disoriented when it comes to seeing the new creation because the, the, the song and the, and the harmonies of the new creation, we are listening to them in the midst of the cacophonies of the old creation. And the signs of the end of, of our destination, we are encountering while being stuck in the middle of the mucky way. And so I think that as we then uh, look for new guidelines, uh, we, uh, then I'm going to suggest for us uh, some new, some, uh, some things to consider as we think of the new creation and this gift and our destination. And the first is this, God is first, primero Dios. The vision of the new creation that we encounter in scripture is, is a Christocentric initiative and thus Trinitarian. God acts first and God acts first through Jesus Christ to reconcile all things to himself. The new creation is God's gift and the church's task. It is first God's gift, something that we didn't merit, we didn't deserve, we didn't, we didn't necessarily even look for it. God offers this to us, surprises us with this gift, and then commissions us to make the new creation the task uh, that we commit ourselves to anticipating and to moving towards. The new creation makes possible and will only be possible by adopting a new worldview. Reconciliation requires personal and institutional convent con conversion. It requires the overturning and adopting new ways of seeing, new perspectives from which we see, turning some things upside down, which will allow us to see a plurality of constellations. I have here uh, an image of the, the, what is called the Southern Cross. Uh, the Southern Cross, as you know, the, the North Star can only be seen from the Northern Hemisphere. If you try to guide your journey by looking for the North Star in your south of the equator, it will not work. Uh, instead, you look to the Southern Cross. But I thought that the Southern Cross does more to actually than simply point the way, it gives us a shape, a cruciform shape, a cross shape for our journey. A and a journey that includes not just reconciliation, but requires conversion, as I said, requires repentance, requires reparation, requires liberation, requires restitution, there is a plurality of constellations. And sometimes, depending on where you are located, there are some constellations and some aspects of the, view, the new creation shown for us in scripture that will be more helpful guides than others. Much depends on what latitude are you doing theology and ministry from. Then also the light of the new creation comes up to us amidst clouds and twinkles. We, we do not see it always in the brightness of the sun. Much of it comes to us and there are times when it's, the sky is overcast and it seems like there is no light to guide us. And yet we have assurance that beyond the clouds, the stars do still shine and that God gives us other light to accompany our journey even when it seems like the horizons are closed in on us. The light of the new creation breaks through in the midst of the shadows of lament and of the old creation. It is a long pilgrimage. It is a long journey, more a way of the cross than a strategic project that we can plan out and map out on the timeline. And yet it is also, and also it is a mysterious destination because we do not know clearly where we're going. We, what we do know is that there's no future without forgiveness and I would add no future without fiesta. And that the journey itself, even amidst the shadows of lament is ultimately a joyful journey. So this is what I wanted to offer for us today. These, uh, these guide for the disoriented, it includes me, new constellations with which to guide our journey, new pieces of the portrait, a portrait that when, comes, when it comes together, it forms the image of Christ, the firstborn of God, the firstborn of all creation, in whom all things, all things hold together. Thank you very much. Thank you, Edgardo, for that helpful first plenary, uh, helping us answer the question 
of where we're headed for new creation. Um, our next uh, voice that we're going to hear from is a colleague, um, Peyton Silken. He's currently presenting, he's currently, sorry, pursuing his master's degree in dispute resolution at the Strauss Institute at Pepperdine Law, where he's training to be a mediator. I met Peyton last year. Um, he attended one of our online summer institute sessions that he had found out about through following the work of my colleague, Nina Balmaceda. This academic school year, Peyton also joined the CFR as a member of our Berean cohort spiritual formation community. He brought a deep sense of wisdom, an open heart to this spiritual formation work that we en encountered together. Peyton believes deeply that peacemaking and social justice of the gospel are the keys to dismantling syst systemic forms of oppression that plague our communities today. Peyton is joining us from Oakland, California where he is a minister of this local congregation at, at Thy Word Christian Center, and where he is working in his community, both at Pepperdine and in his own family and his um, church family, to think about and examine what it means to be engaged in the work of reconciliation. Welcome, Peyton. Uh, thank you, Valerie. Um, I want to also just begin by thanking all of the team that's worked tirelessly behind the scenes to bring this together. Um, was on the call earlier this morning with some of them. Uh, thank you, Nina, uh, for being such a great mentor as well. And thank you, Edgardo, um, for just really beginning us with something that is so essential and pivotal as we understand what this sojourn means. There is a profound beauty in beginning with the end. A, a deep spiritual experience that accompanies a conjuring up of a vision of a world that does not yet exist. And yet to still hold on to the reality that it is a possibility, regardless of the circumstances and obstacles and as he was talking, I, I, when I think about this endeavor, my mind immediately goes to Nehemiah, who was tasked with rebuilding the wall of Jerusalem when it was in heaps, when it was nothing more than rubble. God tasked him to go and accompany the children of Israel because they were left defenseless without that wall. And as he sifted through all of that rubble, he began to hold on to that vision that God had given him of a new wall and of a new relationship with him. And when I think of reconciliation, isn't that exactly what it is? It's the belief of the possibility of a new relationship with one another, yes, but perhaps more importantly with our creator with what is the foundation of our essence. And sometimes we miss that, that the work of reconciliation is not necessarily to get along better with an in-law or to get along better with somebody who doesn't look like you, but the work of reconciliation is profoundly rooted in the idea that we are all God's creation. And so how do we get back to that Garden of Eden kind of ecstasy of being in complete harmony with creation? the exasperated and dispensated relationship that came from the fall, what is the process that we come back and it's envisioning this theme of new creation. And so as I reflect on this theme, I wanna share with you all, I guess it's most fitting about the moment in my life where I was really slapped in the face by this reality. Um, I'm gonna share my screen now. So, you know, in this world of Zoom, we always worry about technical difficulties. So if y'all are praying folk, go ahead and send a quick one up for me. Okay. Are you guys all able to see that? Let me hit present. This is the moment when I was at the 16th Street Baptist Church 
in Birmingham, Alabama, kneeling before the altar. And for those of you who are thinking, wow, that name sounds familiar, I'm not entirely sure where that is. The 16th Street Baptist Church is the church where four little girls were killed in the bombing um, during the height of Jim Crow. Because this was one of the churches that was used to meet together and gather the folk who were planning on how do we dismantle the unjust civil laws and practices of the segregated South. And as a message of retaliation, they began bombing churches and bombing buildings and bombing families. I had just, I guess, let me roll back and give you guys a little bit more context. I had just heard the testimony of one of the sisters of the four little girls that was killed in that, killed in that bombing. She went on to tell us about what that day meant to her community and to her family. As she explained how she knew the other three little girls and how they were just playing with each other in Sunday school, even Sundays prior, and what it meant for them to sift through the rubble and the aftermath of that explosion in order to find the remains of her sister that brought me to my knees. But it wasn't just her testimony alone that brought me to my knees in that moment because just days prior on this experience called Sojourn to the Past, this was my junior year of high school. So I was about 16, 17 years old in this photo. I had met and encountered the cousin of Emmett Till, who was a young man who was murdered in Money, Mississippi, who was lynched for allegedly whistling at a white woman. And as his cousin, his name is Simeon, who I spoke with, described how he loved Emmett so dearly. He was there with him that day in the shop and Simeon and Emmett were laying in the same bed next to each other the night that they came and took away Emmett to murder him. That story brought me to my knees in this moment. I had met just prior as well, people who were present on Bloody Sunday as they were marching across the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama for voting rights. And they told of how they would meet and how they planned to go and march and bring the body of Jimmy Lee Jackson, a young black man who was killed for protesting for the right to vote and march it from Selma to Montgomery, Alabama. And they told of how they were met with dogs and, and batons and people who were deputized to beat them down on the bridge. And that story brought me to my knees and I cannot begin to tell you all of the people who I met and encountered that day whose testimonies brought me to my knees in that moment. And as I was dealing with the irreconcilable world of what we held, what I was experiencing in that moment with the vision that God had given us of Revelation 7 and all of us being together, every nation, tribe, and tongue, I held that together in tension as how could that be when where we are right now is so far from it? that brought me to my knees. And while I was down there, they elaborated on the story of how after that bombing in the 16th Street Baptist Church, the stained glass window that they had behind the altar, which features Jesus standing there with his arms open, that stained glass window immediately after the bombing was broken but the whole window wasn't broken. The only thing that was blown out from that stained glass window was the face of Jesus himself. The whole stained glass remained there, but the face of Jesus was gone. And so I heard the voice of God and I knew that I was reminded that no matter what, how broken this world is right now, that God is still seeing this that Jesus is still witnessing this and that what broke his heart back during the times of Isaiah and Nehemiah and Jeremiah is still breaking his heart during our times of Trayvon Martin, of uh, Michael Brown, of uh, Eric Garner, uh, of George Floyd is still breaking the heart of the Lord of all the other injustices that we are seeing today, not just racially, but socially and economically and 
spiritually, emotionally. All of these things still break his heart. And that gave me strength to rise up from that ground and understand while I didn't at that moment, I knew that a new creation was forming in me. That I could no longer be a junior high school student who didn't really care about the rest of the world. I was a baseball player. All I cared about was playing baseball and having fun. But there was a deeper call. A call that I believe so many of us have heard on this Zoom call right now, or are still seeking and listening, and we're just trying to figure out how do we play a role? Where do we fit in? And that call got me up from that church floor. And it led me into a life now where I understood how reconciliation is essential to understanding what it means to be in relation with God. I've been blessed to be able to have experiences like Valerie mentioned of being a part of this Berean cohort where I've met so many phenomenal men and women who are endeavoring in this task, some of which are on this call today. So shout out to our Berean cohort. I've been able and blessed to work with Pepperdine University in building a foundation for how reconciliation can be discussed amongst college students and even broadened out into the community. It even led up to ultimately God allowing me to speak and give a TEDx talk about this very subject. So that way we are able to give the vocabulary and the language needed for those who are wondering and weary, as Edgardo mentioned earlier, sojourners on this path to be able to figure out where do we go from here. But most importantly, what inspired me during my trip down to the South was all of those stories of the people that I mentioned, Simeon Wright, the cousin of Emmett Till, one of the sisters of the four little girls and many others, was their profound experience of forgiveness. How none of them held on to bitterness. Not one. Not one of them hated the person or the people or the system or the society that was responsible for this yet their heart broke with love. A profound pouring out of what could be. And Agardo concluded with, there is no future without forgiveness. And so I wanna leave it on this similar note that I had to understand in me when I got up off of that floor, what bitterness did I need to release in order to get to that Revelation 7? Because there can be no unity in Revelation 7, without practicing what Paul teaches and Jesus teaches about forgiveness building up there. That like Nehemiah, when he was looking at that rubble, he had to begin stone by stone. Reconciliation is a process of everything that came before that moment and everything that comes later on. And so Valerie asked us to create questions and I wasn't able to send her in a question, but maybe I can pose it right now of understanding what within us do we need to release in order to get to that Revelation 7 vision? What gives you hope that this is possible? Where do we go from here? Because we know where the destination is stone by stone. It's a process. So I want to conclude just by thanking Valerie and Nina again and everybody else on this call as we endeavor with one another. Perhaps the most reassuring thing is that Nehemiah didn't build that wall alone. He had the vision from God, but he also had the children of Israel alongside him. And if you look at this call, there's 96 people here assembled on this call, and that does not reflect all in this world who are endeavoring towards reconciliation. So we are not in this alone. Know that and trust in that. Know that God sees you where you are, and he sees where we are headed. He's already proclaimed it. So have faith in that, and let that fuel you as you conjure up the vision and hold on to that hope of a community that is not yet seen here. 
but will be. God bless you all. Peyton, thank you so very much for your passion and your words of wisdom. Um, for everyone else on the call, you can see why we invited Peyton to share with us this morning. And I name that he and the others in the Berean cohort and the rest of you on this call are my hope. Um, we're transitioning now into a time where we will break into smaller groups. Uh, I want to thank in advance our fearless leaders of groups who have been prepped with some questions and you just heard Peyton give us a few more questions. We will not have a lot of time because we never have enough time for the rich conversations that come. But we hope that within each small group that you'll be able to um, introduce yourselves briefly and to begin the process of reflecting on what you've heard this morning and what this vision of new creation means for you and for reconciliation. And so we'll take about 20 to 25 minutes. Um, Morgan, my wonderful faithful student associate, Morgan Dines has set us up into small groups you will be automatically put into the group. There is a Spanish speaking group as well. So uh, you'll be able to discuss. And, uh, and then we'll come back and reconvene in about uh, 25 minutes and have a bit more time to hear what, what people have stirring up within them in this conversation. Um, so I look forward to seeing you shortly. Morgan, you can send us to groups now. back into the room. And for the next 20 minutes or so, we're gonna take some time um, for a group collective conversation, a larger group. You had a smaller group uh, time to talk. And so now we invite um, everyone to um, enter into a more broad discussion. I have opened the chat so that you have the ability now, or you should have the ability now to chat with more than just me. So anything that you put into the chat now would be seen by everyone. And what we'd like to do in this time is to um, invite you to share something, maybe an important uh, point struck for you during the plenary talks that we had this morning, or maybe someone raised an important question um, that you would like some reflection on from our uh, presenters, Edgardo and, and or Peyton. So I invite you to put your comments and questions into the chat. For those of you who speak Spanish, we invite you also to still participate in this time, but we're going to do it in this way. Please put your question in in Spanish. Um, and I'm hoping that Edgardo and Nina will help to uh, translate the question into English and answer it in English. Our two translators will be prepared to um, then translate the answer so that those of you who are on our Spanish speaking platform can still follow the conversation and discussion, but so that we can all hear and benefit from your question as well. So, I invite you now um, to an open space. You can unmute yourself and, um, and you can um, share with us. What, what did you um, hear in your small group that is during your um, conversation? What did you hear this morning that was particularly meaningful, powerful image for you? I invite you to... Um, Put your questions in the chat. While we're waiting for someone else to be brave, I'll share that those of us who are on the logistics team, our two translators, and um, Morgan Dines and myself, had our own little small group. And um, Roberto Chia, who is a mental health professional and is serving as one of our translators today, 
shared that he found the imagery of the mosaic to be particularly useful. The idea of the fragmentation um, of self and the rebuilding. And, um, and so that was something that we reflected on. And he also noted that there are some, uh, some definite links to his profession as a mental health uh, professional as well. And um, so I am seeing that there are things coming into the chat now. Um, someone notes that in their small group, they heard the obstacles to new creation being fear of knowing how to speak against those in power or lack of trust among the group's intention. Do you suggest any practical ideas to inspire our leaders here to step out in faith, to inspire trust in their communities? Um, Edgardo or Peyton, do you have, either of you like to offer a response? Yeah, um, I can go ahead and go. And that's a wonderful question. Um, how do we deal with the idea of trust? Because inevitably, if there's an, a, recon, uh, a relationship that needs reconciliation, odds are it's because there was a breach in trust somewhere down the line. Uh, and everybody's answer is going to be different in terms of how do we navigate that gap. One of the things that I found helpful is by finding that element of value that can only come from relationship with that person or that community. Whether it's safety, if you're talking about police and community relations, um, whether it's uh, closure to a, a conversation, if you're talking about more personal, intimate relationships, um, whether it's, it's so many different things, but you have to find what that element of value is that can only be achieved through having relationship with that person. And while that may not lead to immediate trust, it can spark people to begin to move in faith to build towards that ultimate solution. Um, that's one of the things that I found helpful, but that answer again is gonna be different for everybody. So here's another question, Edgardo, I'm gonna direct this one to you. Um, someone writes, no future without Fiesta is an amazing idea, building on Desmond Tutu's no future without forgiveness. If we're beginning with the end, with peace banking, how do we share this vision gently with those who are hurting? And do people catch this vision um, early on or do you find they need to ease into it? It's a very good question. It, it, I think it does begin with catching the vision and, and with uh, really believing that God is at work uh, in the world and that, and that God's plans are for a future with hope and that this hope is not optimism. And we'll talk more about that on, thir on, uh, on Friday. But I, I think that the question of how to ease people into it it's not unlike the question of, I as a pastor, how do I preach the gospel uh, to people who are experiencing, um, who are ca carrying wounds? How do you preach good news uh, to someone who has lost uh, a family member? How do you preach a funeral sermon and, and proclaim resurrection in the face of the reality of death? And, and, I, th and I think that there is an element of it that I'm that when I'm saying these things I'm also saying them to myself and acknowledging uh, that I am um, that I that I also struggle to be, to to believe this uh, or to live into this reality even if as I affirm it and and to uh, to say that there is an element here of mystery that acknowledging that the future that God has promised us is one of reconciliation, is one of life, does not at all negate the reality of the suffering that is present now. And that in fact, the risen Christ still carries wounds is one way for me of to also to suggest to people, the suffering that you're experiencing is not invalidated by the resurrection. It's actually carried over into the resurrection but with the promise of transformation. 
and and so so there's there's no um, there, there's no prescription here, no recipe for getting it just right. It requires uh, patience. Uh, it requires uh, discernment. Uh, it requires taking risks. It requires uh, being willing to get it wrong, and to sometimes leaning in too have, coming in too strong and having to say, you know, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. Uh, so, so also uh, that kind of vulnerability that. Uh, that I, as a minister of the gospel, also get it wrong. Uh, so I, I think that's, uh, so those would be some things I, I would offer. Uh, and, and simply to, uh, to say there are some things that we believe and we know about our final destination, about, the, about God's pr uh, purposes, but we don't always have to say everything at one time. And so it's a matter of choosing what is the right word for this moment. And, and sometimes the right word, as the right practice is, we'll say tomorrow, lament. And that we're in a moment of lament, and that it, and if we're, when we're in a moment of lament, we should not uh, short circuit the lament by moving too quickly to resolution and to hallelujahs. Uh, there's a season, a time for everything. And so I think that's the, another aspect of it to say that, and that the certainty of the promises of God also creates room for a lament that does not uh, collapse into despair. Thank you. So there have been some other interesting comments in the chat. I'm not sure if I'll get to all the questions and comments, but the next one that I um, found provocative is one that um, is something that we often have to think about. Um, so someone notes that they enjoyed the icon iconography that was used in um, the PowerPoint presentation this morning. Um, it displayed diversity and ethnicities. But the question I think is one that we are struggling with more and more. The question is, since it is common knowledge that the um, image of Jesus that the church uses is historically inaccurate, why um, do it, we continue to use it? It perpetuates that God is white and enforces a colonized mindset of the Western world. And yet it is pretty pervasive. And so, um, yeah, there was a question about why, why do we persist in using this kind of imagery? Reactions from either of you or maybe. Maybe I can say a word about that. Um, it's very complicated because there's a history of the production of images that has uh, formed us and perhaps mal mal malformed us uh, in, in many ways. And I was speaking about this with, uh, actually with, about this topic with Jackson Adama yesterday. We were having a conversation about uh, a number of topics and, and how uh, in his experience, uh, and Jackson could say you know, more to that, there's, there, there can be resistance uh, even uh, in, in, uh, in, con in context of Christianity say in Africa, uh, West Africa, to images of Christ that are more contextually uh, 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 and culturally appropriate because there's been such a preponderance of images that are white that's, that there's something, something that's what Jesus is like. I've encountered this also in Latin America uh, when we take our students in El Salvador uh, from, uh, to visit a church with the black Christ, some students will say, but wait, no, Jesus is white uh, because that's the imagery that they have received. What I, what I love about the image of Jesus, uh, the, the, uh, the, the statue of Jesus that we visit in El Sábado, the Black Christ, is that the way that statue became black was because of the combination of the smoke of the candles with the wood, uh, light colored wood. And so it was like the prayers of the people in response to the suffering around them led to a Christ that looked more like them and less like than the colonizer. And so for me, it's like, this is a powerful image that Christ will not let himself remain colonized. And Christ is gonna be working the power of the spirit and, and moving through the people of God to decolonize uh, uh, himself, to detach himself from the imageries that, that have been formed around him. At least that's, that's for me a, a hopeful image in that regard. Yeah, we know that this continues to be a, a challenge and a question for the church. And so I thank you for bringing the the question and thank you, Edgardo, for your response too. And we know that 
what we say today that um, our thinking may sh be shaped and changed by uh, our, our interactions with people and, and we may have a different answer in another year or two about um, what using these images mean. But I do like what you said um, that, that God, that Jesus, that Christ will not allow himself to be contained in the box and that that's something that we humans put on, um, on limitations. So um, another person wanted to pick up on something that, that Peyton built on um, when he was speaking about Nehemiah and his passion, uh, his imagery of building the wall. Um, this person says, are there walls in the new creation? In Revelation, there's an image of many tribes and tr tongues and nations, which seems to suggest some kind of a wall around identities or nationalities. Um, so how should we think of walls in the Ministry of Reconciliation? I don't know if either of you wants to tackle that. I love this question. This is such a phenomenal question. Um, so I'll speak, I guess, from my, in, in reference to how I was building on it was that wall was symbolic of the relationship um, between God and Israel, right? It was torn down, right, with the destruction when Babylonians came and the children were sent into exile. Um, and that rebuilding was symbolic of that kind of renewed relationship with God. And so when we talk about the process of reconciliation, I think how walls are built by men uh, has been to put out other people and designate you are the other and we don't want you here for X, Y, and Z reasons. And that's an idea of toxicity that we need to fight against because in Revelation 7, there's not that, right? With the idea of every nation, tribe, and tongue, yes, there's yeah, it's the beautiful idea of diversity, right? In the same way that there is a fluid exchange of that diversity, that I'm still me completely and wholly, and you are still you, because it's not reconciliation if we're one in the same, in the sense, right? The reconciliation is two separate, you know, becoming in new relationship with one another, right? Um, the idea of the Trinity is that, you know, they're separate bodies, but all unified together. Right, and so the question is, is there walls around the Trinity? And I guess that's a big theological question too that we shouldn't get into, but um, that's kind of how uh, I'm approaching it is that it's not one where we view walls of trying to cast others out and designate people as bad for other reasons, but it's one where we are able to be fully who I am, the idea of Ubuntu, I am who I am because you are who you are. And I'll never fully be able to be who I need to be until you are fully who you are when you are where you need to be and living together in that unity. So I don't know if that helps at all, but yeah. Thank you, Peyton. Edgardo, do you have anything to add? Maybe one way in which I think of this is how the day of Pentecost, uh, when we had, you had the multitudes out of all these nations and they could hear and uh, understand and understand each other, understand the good news in their own native tongue. Uh, so there's the miracle of communication, and yet there's this question that is asked: Are not all these Galileans? It's like, well, why would you ask that question? Uh, saying, ah, because even as you're hearing them, you can still hear their accent. And so that that for me, this is that's how I read this: is that that the, the new creation doesn't get rid of our accents. It doesn't get rid of our particularities. These are now uh, used to the glory of God. And so that even as we are in that multitude of Revelation 7 and all of us gather on the throne, uh, we, we, I, I, I will still have, I think, my accent. Uh, and, and all of us will, uh, because that's a, a mark of our own history and of how God uh, uh, takes his history, validates it, affirms it, and raises it up. So. That's also how I think about this. Great, thank you both for your responses to that excellent question. Um, there is another question that uh, may or may not fit into your wheelhouse um, for both of you, but I'll, I'll toss it out. Um, someone asked what dialogue conversation strategies uh, are found to be most helpful with folks who are in need of reflection, listening, and reconciliation. So maybe you could just 
maybe highlight something that's been particularly useful for you. I will note before I let you answer the question that I also was asked in the chat um, if we'll be sharing resources, if you will be able to hear this lecture again, if you'll be able to go back and see the images that were in the presentation. And yes, we will be sending some follow-up emails, not this week, but next week, I'll hope to send each of you that have participated um, uh, information about how to access that. But for now, um, Edgardo or, or Peyton, what, what strategies have been really helpful as you encounter working with people who are in need of reflection, listening, and reconciliation? So, um... As Valerie mentioned earlier, uh, I'm recently graduating from my, my master's program in dispute resolution um, at the Strauss Institute at Pepperdine. So I'm kind of what that means is I've been trained as a mediator to be able to go into situations and scenarios where there are parties or two people who are in deep conflict and are trying to seek some sort of resolution. One of the things that they have us focus in on is um, one, establishing what is the need. Oftentimes the conflict that is manifest, that is bringing them to the table, is not necessarily what's truly at the root of the engagement, right? And so what you have to do is you have to make each person feel listened to. And so when we look at that idea of reflection, listening, and reconciliation, I think listening kind of comes first of we have to get people into a space where they're able to do deep, what we call active listening with one another uh, in a way that's not listening to be, you know, full of defense, but in a way that's truly listening to understand. And that's sometimes the hardest part of the process is how do we move people to the, from defensive positions to where they're able to actually hear what's really going on with the other person. Um, and that's been one of the strategies that's been really helpful with us as mediators is we're neutral, is we're able to hear and listen and then try to reflect back to them what it is that we've heard and kind of do something that's called affect labeling, which is labeling the emotion. Because some people may describe a whole situation but not know how they're feeling. And so when you say, oh, I can imagine that being devastating to you, or you feel like you've been neglected in this way or unappreciated, that can get people to say, yeah, that is how I'm feeling. And then more likely to be able to listen. And that when you begin to get into the reflection and then the ultimate, hopefully, reconciliation. Thanks, Peyton. Before Edgardo uh, might share something with us, um, one of our participants notes that active listening is really challenging in, in this kind of critical engagement, especially where we feel like there's a strong need for reconciliation. And I think one thing I just want to affirm is that the work of reconciliation and, and the work we're all engaged in, whatever it might be, um, it's, it is difficult. And that's why we need the community and that's why we need each other. And that's why we need spaces like this to have this kind of conversation and to encourage and support one another and to share what we do have. So Edgardo, what, what do you have? What wisdom do you have to share with us? I don't know about wisdom. Uh, you're asking too much there, but but uh, I I I do think that uh, we're getting out to some very important questions that are also going to be very contextually situated, uh, and in terms of how do we uh, uh, create support a culture of uh, of dialogue and encounter. But my my own uh, experience with this comes from. Uh, my work on ecumen ecumenism and on ecumenical dialogues. And I have found that uh, in those dialogues, there are some lessons that I think can be important uh, for, other, uh, for other engagements uh, where the, uh, in, in the ecumenical dialogues uh, that, that I've been in, say, with, Rome, with the Roman Catholic Church, as I, I myself am a Methodist, uh, there is a sense of a long journey that we're on, on the we're on a long journey here we're not going to be uh and we're not going to be fixing things here uh there's no quick fix uh there is uh and because there's no quick fix there's a need for honesty uh as to where are we uh where are we experiencing differences in, in our and in, in misunderstandings of charity uh in our listening charity of interpretation uh of creativity uh, to to to, to uh, time to think: Are there ways in which we can uh, expand our common ground and build on common ground? 
and but I say also patience, uh, because the, the I mean, there's this is work that has begun before us, before I came on the scene, and will continue after I, I have I have left this the, the, this place, but but it's patience that is guided by the conviction that this is actually the work of God and that we're participating in it, and that and that uh, ultimately it will be all right. I mean that at the end we know it works out because. Again, in that vision of Revelation 7 that Peyton was talking about, saying that in the case of ecumenism, it doesn't say, and there are so many people from, and, and there's a Baptist church here, and the, and, the, and, the, and the Methodist church there, and the Catholic church there, it's one. And so, you, so the work of reconciliation will not be in vain. Uh, it, it, will, it, it will ultimately uh, reap a harvest of justice and, and, and of peace. But in this life, I may only see a few uh, shoots of that. Uh, so a few flowers to that. So, uh, so I, I would say pay, th those are for me some things I gather from uh, th that I've harvested from ecumenical dialogues that I think can be important uh, when, with the proper contextualization in other situations. Uh, Valerie, you're muted. Uh, just real quick, I would I add. I just noticed that. Go ahead. <laughs> um, that. Um, restorative circles, there's a whole lot of practices in restorative justice that are trying to answer these questions, uh, whether it's in social or whether it's in uh, now moving into criminal cases of uh, restorative justice practices that are asking, well, how do we take people who somebody's committed a crime, an atrocity, a violation, something like that, and still being able to have dialogue and see them as a person, as a human being? Um, that's allowed for tremendous results in terms of rehabilitation of not just the offender, but also the victim. Um, and then seeing the, the victim as not just that one person, but the whole community. And how do we get the community involved in these dialogues? And that's one of the things that have been explored with a lot of success is that it's not just, okay, person X and person Y, but it's so many other people that have been affected that are contributing to building a holistic and restorative place. So there are a lot of resources there um, that can be used for how do you begin to um, formalize these dialogues. But again, as Edgardo said, it's a lot of contextualization as well. Yeah, thank you. I want to I want to thank both of you for also highlighting that our our work is really intersectional. It's not um, an interdisciplinary. And the, the tools that we have from the field of, of, of justice and the um, tools that we have from theology and the tools that we have from the field of peacemaking and, and mental health, um, all of these things are useful. And it's part of this mosaic as well that as we try to reassemble, we need multiple tools and multiple approaches. And that's part of why the Center for Reconciliation often says that we really believe it's the call of all uh, Christians to be engaged in the work of reconciliation. But how that looks and what that means for each of us is different because God has uniquely um, gifted us in different ways and has uh, put us into spaces and, and, and our life experiences are different. And all of that richness leads into um, how we have been shaped and uniquely created by God to be able to give something to this effort. Um, so I did want to note that uh, one of our Spanish speaking participants had um, commented on uh, this question about dialogues um, to say, and I'm translating paraphrasing since I'm not a Spanish speaker, but basically um, in a dialogue that hopes to be, uh, that hopes to be correct, people have to have the possibility to express themselves as clearly as possible while still being respectful of the other participants. And I think that's exactly right. I thank you for that comment. Um, we do have more things coming in um, on the chat, uh, the imagery of the wall and the discussion about uh, what that means. There's some rich comments in the chat. I hope you'll take time to, to look at some of that. Um, uh, David Foster asks about a survey question about how many of the churches represented in this meeting are actively sponsoring groups to discuss this topic in their church communities. I don't have that answer, 
But I think that's a very good question because I think that's the next step of what the CFR would like to do is encourage and support us not just to learn academically, but how do we put these things into practice? So first we have to do a little bit of what Peyton shared with us this morning and reflect deeply on where we need reconciliation and how we're being called and formed. We need the tools, the theological things um, that um, the framing to help share with our, our communities and congregations. Um, but yeah, we also need to, to decide to go ahead and make an effort, even if knowing that it's gonna be imperfect, that will fall short in many ways. But, um, but God is in the process with us and we have so many wonderful companions on the journey with us. So I hope that you will continue to see the Center for Reconciliation as a partner uh, in this process, at least for conversation, and that you will also start to build a network of other people on this call and not only look to the Center for Reconciliation for this. Um, let's see, I, I'm seeing some notes of people who are planning to have these kind of conversations in their congregations, and that's wonderful. I think there was a question, one more question, and maybe this will be the last one for this session today. Um, and it's a big one. So I'm, I, you know, five minutes is not enough time, but how do we begin to build common ground in a time of international disinformation? So, you know, the media, Facebook, social media, we often find ourselves in information silos. Um, do you have any thoughts uh, Edgardo or Peyton about how we begin to build common ground in this particular time. I think I went first last time, so Edgardo, I'm gonna put it on you. <laughs> <laughs> I think that building common ground means leaning into uh, the core stories of our faith. And, and, uh, and presenting those stories uh, and in, a, in a way that is more compelling uh, than the way that stories are other stories around us. It makes me think of the, the imagery, the contrast of the imagery of uh, 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 Perseus uh, and, uh, and uh, Orpheus. And uh, when, when, the, when they are nearing the, the sirens, sorry, not Perseus, Odysseus, Odysseus, knowing the sirens will lead the crew astray, has himself bound to a mast, trying to not listen to the siren song. Um, Orpheus instead uh, uh, outplays the sirens and, 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 and plays more beautiful, compelling song that, that keeps him from being led astray and shipwrecking. And I think that uh, for me, the, uh, the, at least my call, I understand it to say, it's not simply to say, try to, stop my ears and I'm not listening to what other uh, news sources are so on saying, but to pro proclaim the gospel, that we have a story to tell that is a better story than the stories that are around us and it has power uh, to, uh, to transform reality. And so that, so in that sense, uh, to, to keep us from shipwrecking. So that's, that would be my, my sense. Wonderful. Amen. Um, just to, to build on that, is the only way to battle disinformation is to, to seek out, to seek it out ourselves, right? Uh, and to do that. I had so much different disinformation about immigrant communities until I started working in immigrant communities. And I learned about the richness that is there and how much of that stuff is really not true, right? And so likewise, we have to be, be willing to go out and engage with the people who are presumed or deemed the other. And I saw in the chat about how do we invite criminals into the context, similar thing, right? You, we, society, we label criminals as all X and irredeemable until I began working in context in prisons and in jails. And then you learn really about the history and what's going on there um, and who these as individuals, as peoples are, and it changes you. And I think the only way to battle the, the broader disinformation that we see in social media is to actually be social with one another uh, and learn that. Uh, and to take things with a grain of salt in the sense of you're going to encounter some people that do fit those stereotypes or molds or whatever, 
But in the same way that God doesn't view all of humanity in the same way as writing us all off as bad and evil, but it gives us all the opportunity to come into relationship with him because he sees us all as worthy of his love. Uh, so don't just write people off if you have one or two bad experiences with somebody that fits into that category uh, would be my only plea. Well, thank you both so much um, for your wonderful presentations this morning and for your thoughtful responses when uh, put on the spot with some very hard questions. We know this is not the end of the conversation. This time together today is just one piece of the ongoing conversation and work. But it is uh, approaching the one o'clock hour here in North Carolina, which means we have come to the end of this segment. And in a moment, I'm going to offer us a, a closing word. But before that, I also want to just let all of you know, we are recording these sessions. We will eventually be able to post them on our YouTube page, and I will share links with all of you who have registered. Um, I have your email addresses, and so you will get access to this information. Peyton has uh, done a TED Talk that you might find interesting, and he's posted the link in the chat, so um, I encourage you to take a listen to that if you're interested. Um, the Center for Reconciliation is providing this year's institute as a free service, but it was not free to us to produce it. So if you are so inclined and to support the work of the CFR, we invite you to um, seek out our uh, giving page and, and make a contribution. There is no pressure that you have to do so. We're happy to provide this material, but we would also welcome your gifts and support monetarily if you're so blessed and inclined to do so. Um, and also, um, oh, I had one other thing and I think, oh yes, please join us again this evening. Uh, in, in a number of hours, we will have uh, uh, a roundtable discussion tonight on uh, with some of our Divinity School partners, thinking about what it means to, to move from being a school that has a center for reconciliation to truly being a center that is a reconciliation as a whole school. So we hope that you will join us for that. The link that you used to join us today is the same link for all of the sessions of the Summer Institute. So you have the link, you're here, just reuse that link the next time that you join us. Um, I'm going to offer us uh, a prayer and a poem uh, in time of pandemic. For me, um, the natural world and the arts are things that have helped me. And I was struck uh, several weeks ago by the, the beauty of this poem. So it's from uh, poet Kim Stafford. It comes out of a collection called How to Love the World, Poems of Gratitude and Hope. Here are the words of Kim Stafford. Shelter in place. Long before the pandemic, the trees knew how to guard one place with roots and shade. Moss found how to hug a stone for life. Every stream works out how to move in place, staying home even as it flows generously outward, sending bounty far. Now is our time to practice, singing from balconies, sending words of comfort by any courier, kindling our lonesome generosity to shine in all directions like stars. Ever-present God, in Christ Jesus, you never leave or forsake us. Teach us to be faithful to your call, to persevere in commitment, and beyond all else, to know the strength and joy of being near you and in communion with our brothers and sisters. Help us to live life from the end as a person who knows where we are going, as a people who know where we are going. In the name of our Savior, amen. amen. Go now in peace. We'll see you at the next session.